This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. We are broadcasting live from the U.N. Climate Summit in Bonn, Germany. This year, it's known as the first Islands COP, with BG presiding over this year's summit. The event itself is being held in Bonn, Germany, because of the logistical challenges of hosting 25,000 people in Fiji at the start of the South Pacific cyclone season. Today is also Gender Day here at the U.N. Climate Conference. Well, we're joined now by the first woman president of the Marshall Islands, Hilda Heine, and her daughter, poet and climate change activist, Kathy Jetno Kijiner. This is Kathy reading one of her poems at a U.N. climate change gathering in New York City in 2014, only days after the Massive People's Climate March, the largest climate march in history. Kathy's poem is written as a letter to her child. Dear Matafele Benum, don't cry. Mommy promises you no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's becoming a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea and to the Taro Islanders of Fiji, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here because we, baby, are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo boo, jima, your country, and your president, too. We will all That's fight. That's Kathy Jetno Kijiner back in 2014. Well, less than two years later, her own mother, Hilda Heine, was elected president of the Marshall Islands, becoming the first female president of an independent Pacific nation. And they're still fighting. Climate change and sea level rise poses a particularly devastating threat to low-lying island nations like the Marshall Islands, a chain of volcanic islands and coral atolls in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, between Hawaii and the Philippines. According to a report by the U.S. Geological Survey, many atoll islands will be flooded annually, salinizing the limited freshwater resources and thus likely forcing inhabitants to abandon their islands in decades, not centuries, as previously thought." Unquote. But climate change is not the first existential threat the Marshall Islands has faced. Between 1946 and 58, the United States conducted more than 60 large-scale nuclear tests there, the largest, known as the Bravo shot, was a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb and vaporized three small islands. The nuclear testing forced people from their homes and caused long-lasting health impacts, including women giving birth to jellyfish babies, tiny infants born with no bones. In 2014, the Marshall Islands launched an unprecedented lawsuit against the United States and eight other countries at the International Court of Justice at The Hague, accusing them of failing to meet international commitments for nuclear disarmament. The lawsuit was rejected in 2016 after the court said it did not have jurisdiction over the case. Well, for more on climate change and the long legacy of nuclear testing, we're joined now by the president of the Marshall Islands herself, Hilda Heine, and her poet daughter, climate change activist Kathy Jetnell Kitchener. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Madam President, uh, your thoughts today at this first Islands COP, this first COP summit, the UN Climate Summit, um, that is sponsored by uh, another South Pacific island, Fiji. The significance of this? Well, it's it's very uh, significant for uh, Pacific Island countries, uh, you know, being our first one. So it's important for us to be here to let the world know that uh, everyone has to um, do their part. We are wanting to be here to make sure that countries increase their ambition so that the 1.5 degrees can be uh, maintained. Uh, that's uh, the the uh, importance for our island country in order for us to survive. So it's very important. Uh, this COP is very important for that, for us. And this is the first UN climate summit since President Trump announced that he's pulling the United States out of the Paris Climate Accord. What does that mean to yeah, you? That's why it's all all that more important for us to be here and to gather the support from uh, other countries around the world. We were very disappointed when, of course, when President Trump uh, pulled out the United States from the Paris Agreement. 
uh, we see them uh, as important uh, leaders in the world and uh, should be uh, taking the leadership role in the climate fight. So when uh, it decided to pull the U.S. from from the Paris Agreement, it was a very disappointing act for countries like the Marshall Islands. What message do you have for President Trump today? We just played their first, and it looks like only, uh, event that they're holding here at the climate summit, where they were pushing coal, nuclear and gas. Well, I think we're all for uh, coal to be kept underground, and we want to make sure that uh, uh, President Trump um, understand the importance of uh, emission and uh, what's going on in, in terms of uh, coal uh, being, um, being promoted by his administration. Uh, we want to make sure that oh, we want uh, President Trump to, um, to acknowledge the signs. There is no longer debate about the issue of climate change. We need to make sure that, you know, we're doing all we can to ensure the survivability of all the uh, island countries, especially, and the rest of the world. Hmm. I wanted to ask you about this idea, um, which sadly isn't an idea but a reality, of what they call jellyfish babies. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the legacy of nuclear testing in the South Pacific, in the Marshall Islands. Talk about, first of all, how many islands make up the Marshall Islands? I don't think people realize <laughs> okay. the breadth and scope. Yeah, well, we have uh, uh, 33 islands in the Marshall Islands, uh, uh, atolls, actually, uh, with many other smaller islands, about a thousand some. But the communities are 33. We have 24 island communities. Uh, uh, that are inhabited with, with actual communities uh, in the Marshall Islands. Um, the, uh, the legacy of the, the nuclear uh, testing program uh, brings back um, the old issue of colonialism and how the U.S. has colonized the, you know, the Marshall Islands. To this day, we're still struggling with the legacy of the, uh, you know, what you call jellyfish uh, babies. Uh, we have people. This who, is babies without babies bones. Babies without bones that were born by women who were uh, who lived in the islands that were uh, contaminated, and we still have people who have not returned to their homelands after 50 years of uh, being uh, displaced from their homelands. Uh, we have islands that were vaporized by the uh, nuclear testing program. Of course, these islands belong to people, and uh, those can never be uh, recovered. Uh, so we're still seeking nuclear justice for the people of the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. This is one of the, uh, the legacy of the U.S. Uh, uh, presence in our country. And it seems like uh, we're repeating with the climate change uh, issue coming on. Uh, also, same uh, uh, force from outside uh, being brought to uh, influence or to impact the livelihood of Marshallese. Mm. Your grandniece, Kathy, your niece, Kathy Jetno Kitchener, died at the age of eight of leukemia? Oh, talking about Bianca. Bianca. Yes. Bianca. Yeah, she died at eight, uh, eight uh, as a result of leukemia. Yeah. And many children like that also. It's not a, this is one of the common, uh, um, this, uh, in, what do you call Sicknesses. it? Sickness. Uh, we have some of the highest rates yeah. of yeah. cancers in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you suffer the highest rates of cancer in the world. Yeah, some of the highest yeah. in so the world. This is one of the impact, the health uh, impact on the people of the Marshall Islands is, is, is you know, beyond uh, our budget to ensure that the people have, uh, are healthy. Uh, again, uh, legacy of the nuclear uh, testing now the Hague, program. The Hague, the International Court of Justice, said it's not within its jurisdiction um, to rule on this suit that you have against the Marshall Islands, and they threw the case out. Are you still asking the United States for reparations? And what does it mean to you that at this COP, COP23, at this summit, the U.S. is pushing nuclear power? Well, it's the same thing as uh, pushing uh, the use of coal, you know, in a world that is acknowledged uh, that climate, uh, climate change is here. Uh, and yet, on the face of that, U.S. is here pushing for use of clean coal, if there is such a thing. Uh, and uh, it's the same thing with the nuclear justice. Here we are, we're still struggling with that, and uh, we, we don't see the end of uh, 
of this uh, journey for, for those people who were impacted by the nuclear uh, testing program of the United States. Mm. So we continue to seek justice. We go to the, we're, we'll be going to the United Nations, and we're trying to also get advocates from around the country to help us with the nuclear uh, justice mm. uh, uh, that is required. So on this gender day, we're here with a mother-daughter team. Um, Madam President, you are the first woman president not only of the Marshall Islands, but of the Pacific Islands. And Kathy Jetno Kijiner, uh, you are her daughter and a longtime climate activist yourself, poet. Um, you wrote a letter to your daughter. We just played a clip of it before, a poem to your daughter. What does it mean to you that your mother has been elected president, and what does it mean for the Marshall Islands? Well, to be honest, I didn't really expect it to happen at all. I, I mean, I never <clears throat> thought that I would see my mom as, you know, as a leader of a country and as a leader of our country, not because she's not, you know, perfect for it, not because she's not worthy, but just because, you know, so much of our society is, is extremely patriarchal, you know, and I think that's also a result of colonization. And, and I think, um, you know, seeing her become president tells me that there are actually changes being made and that there is actually hope for a lot of us women to continue to push and continue to take on leadership positions and make changes that we want to see in the world. And I think that's really, you know, it gave me a lot of hope. And I was extremely proud, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, your final comment, I know you're heading off to yet another meeting. This is part of being president. Um, your final comment to women of the world, why you see in particular the effects of women and children, the effects of climate change, what you see are those effects? Well, there is, uh, in the Marshall Islands, we see the effects on, uh, on, uh, on women and, and their life because they uh, are the... Um, the caretakers of the home. So if there is drought, they're the ones that will have to go out and look for water for the family, look for food in order to cook the meals for the family. So their life is really upside down when there is, uh, there is these uh, events uh, uh, from climate change. We see that firsthand with our droughts, with uh, inundation uh, of uh, the waves coming over our uh, uh, islands and washing uh, homes away. Um, it's it's the women leading the um, leading the uh, the solutions, looking for solutions for families, like they always do. Climate change is another uh, addition to the to the uh, work that women continue to do to make their families survive. Um, we're going to end with the comments of a previous Marshall Islands political leader. I want to thank you so much for being with us. Um, we're going to turn to longtime Marshall Islands political leader, anti-nuclear activist Tony De Bruyne, uh, the late leader. De Bruyne was one of the world's most prominent voices confronting climate change, spent decades organizing against nuclear weapons after having witnessed firsthand the U.S. nuclear testing and his homeland. This is De Bruyne speaking in 2015 as he accepted the Right Livelihood Award known as the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize. Decades after the conclusion of devastating nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands, I might be branded by some as a radical for my impassioned conviction against the use, testing, or possession of nuclear weapons. But this is not radical. It is only logical. I have seen with my very own eyes such devastation and know with conviction that nuclear weapons must never again be visited upon humanity. Between 1946 and 1958, the United States conducted 67 large-scale nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands. That is the equivalence of 1.6 Hiroshima shots every day for 12 years. That was Tony De Bruyne, long times Marshall Islands political leader, accepting the Right Livelihood Award a few years ago, the late leader. And I wanted to end with Kathy Jetno Kitchener uh, talking about your no dapple solidarity. That's the Dakota Access Pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, uh, my 
I was really inspired by the work of the indigenous protesters in No Dapple, just because they were fighting for their land and for clean water in the same way that we are fighting for our islands in the Marshall Islands. And as someone who lives in the U.S. at the moment, I wanted to show my, show my support for the people of their land. And that's why I wrote that poem for them last year. Um, but for me, really, I think I am really inspired by the work of a lot of indigenous activists around the world who are trying to fight for their home, for their culture, and for their people. Thanks so much. Again, our guests have been Kathy Jetno Kajiner, poet and climate activist, and the first woman president of the Marshall Islands, President Hilda Heine. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, Humi Naidu joins us to respond to the U.S. one and only session here at the COP summit, where they brought in corporate executives from the nuclear, gas and coal industry uh, to represent the president of the United States. Stay with us.